Good afternoon. I am Giulio Di Toro. I am a geologist at the University of Padova, Italy. Padova is one of the oldest universities in the world. Was the, uh, it was built in 2022. And I also work quite a lot with the Institute, National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology in Italy, which is much more recent, 1999. And this institute monitors the seismic, the seismic activity in Italy and, volcan and uh, volcanic activity in our country, in my country, which is Italy. And uh, I'm a structural geologist and I work both in the field and in the lab. So what I will try to discuss with you today is how the earthquake engine works. By earthquake engine, we mean the fault. I mean the fault. So my view will be a view starting from the field as a field geologist, but also as a rock experimentalist. So studying how the rocks behave uh, when they are um, sheared like during an earthquake. And this research I will talk you about is funded by the European Research Council, which is the largest foundation for uh, fundamental research in the world. And this is the outline of the talk. So I will uh, start talking about what is an earthquake, but starting from a geological point of view. And then I will talk more in detail, so a close look at the earthquake engine or the, the seismogenic fault. And to do this, I will talk at the beginning about the rusty earthquake engine, that is an exhumed fault that was produced in earthquakes some millions of years ago. And then I will, will move forward, trying to understand how the rocks behave when they are sheared during an earthquake. And so I will try to make the engine work in the lab. And at the very end, I will try to put all this information together. So the geometry and complexity of natural faults with the frictional properties of faults in the point to see here, which is about making the engine, uh, earthquake engine work in models. And of course, especially in countries like Italy and in Mediterranean area, we are all familiar with the damage induced by an earthquake. And of course, this is also due because sometimes people don't follow strictly building codes. And this is a main issue for Italy and many other countries in the world. And this is the damage produced during the 2009 6.1 earthquake that hit L'Aquila in, in April 2009 and resulted in the death of about 309 people. But what is an earthquake? Uh, well, during an earthquake, of course, we feel the ground shaking. Uh, however, uh, these are the result of waves that are propagating from a source, which is the fault, in the war rocks. So, basically, we can think that for earthquake that nucleate in the continental crust and that produce damage, well, they use they usually uh, a nucle uh, nucleate at about 10 kilometer depth. This is where the rupture is born, and then it propagates along the fault. And while this happens, there is the release of the elastic strain energy stored in the wall rocks, and, and it becomes in terms of seismic waves. Now, uh, because there is a fault, clearly earthquakes are due to sleep on surface. And so friction and fracture are really important to understand earthquake mechanics. Of course, I'm not talking here about the fuel of this earthquake engine, which is the elastic strain energy stored in the wall rocks. I will mainly talk about what, happen, what happens along the fault. So you can think there is, for instance, a, a sort of pre-existing joint or a fracture in the rock, and this is a dike, which is what the geologists call the structural marker. And uh, because of seismic sleep, the dike is sheared, is and, uh, and uh, is uh, slip here to the right. Now, this is what we can see in the field. And uh, by friction here, when I talk about what, up, what is going on in this interface, I will always talk about uh, the relationship between, between shear stress and normal stress. So it's an adimensional number and it's called technically friction coefficient. 
So this is one of the very important uh, parameters of the earthquake source. The other one that I will discuss about is the geometry. Uh, because fault surfaces are way with, and th this is something you can appreciate here from this uh, mirror surface that come from the southern Italian Alps. This, uh, the bar here is about two meters, and you can appreciate the roughness of the natural fault. So friction and fault geometries and fault geometry are the keys to understand earthquake physics. Because of our deep seated processes, Earthquakes are usually studied by the inversion of seismic waves. So people record the surface, you know, seismograms, and they invert them, and they get a lot of information about earthquakes. And uh, these are really interesting uh, uh, findings, of course. We know a lot about earthquakes by doing this. So seismology is a very powerful tool to study earthquakes. But in some way, Using, earthquake phys um, using seismology to understand earthquake physics is like trying to understand how the engine of a car works by listening to its noise from far away. Uh, for instance, from seismograms, we can infer how big is the earthquake, so the power of, the, of this engine, the earthquake magnitude. And this is an example of the fault area associated to particular earthquakes. And to the right, you can see Great Britain for scale. So the biggest earthquake ever measured by man, uh, instrumentally by man, so we're talking of the 1960 earthquake that hit Chile. Well, the magnitude was 9.5, and the fault that ruptured it had an area that was as big as Britain, so about 300,000 square kilometers. This is the 9.2, the Alaskan earthquake. And then we go to the right, where there are smaller and smaller earthquakes, which still have a very big magnitude, 7.9 for the 2003 Hokkaido earthquake here. And then, as an example, this minus to six earthquakes that in Italy, and this is the 2009 L'Aquila earthquake. So clearly, bigger is the fault, bigger is the magnitude of the earthquake. However, only a small quantity of the energy that is dissipated during an earthquake that is exchanged during an earthquake goes in radiated energy or seismic waves. It's only a very small fraction. And for instance, for the L'Aquila earthquake was only a quarter of the Hiroshima nuclear bomb. But the energy dissipated in this earthquake was much larger, probably 10,000 times bigger. So it's a small or to 100 times. So it's only a small fraction, perhaps 1% one, 1 or much less of the energy of an earthquake goes in seismic waves. And this is, of course, good. Otherwise, there is nothing left after an earthquake. But of course, if you go to the left, the seismic radiation energy increases and can be as big as 6,000 nuclear bombs for earthquake of minus 9 point something. For instance, uh, this is the most recent big earthquake that hit the world was the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, 9.0. And I will talk later about this earthquake, especially about in some models that we did recently. And this is the tsunami wave triggered by this earthquake. Here is going to flood the Sendai airport to the right. So, of course, um, tsunamis are strictly, especially the large ones, are associated to big to mega earthquakes. And what is important of this earthquake is that also accommodated a lot of sleep. So we can make this basic, basic rule, big earthquake or big magnitude, big fault and big sleep. In the case of the Tuhoku earthquake, this 2011 earthquake, the fault surface was about 100,000 square kilometers. And uh, the colors here, uh, we are in the eastern coast of Japan, and the colors on the surface represent the areas of sleep with uh, up to 55 meters of sleep during this earthquake in this area in red. Basically, it's like an half football court. So it's a big movement of the two blocks, one relative to the other uh, with respect to the fault, 55 meters. And because of this large sleep, there was also an important uplift of the ocean floor that triggered the tsunami wave. So from seismograms, we can infer quite a lot of information, of course. 
And uh, not only the magnitude, so the power of the earthquake engine, but also the some information about the rupture source and, for instance, the direction of the rupture. So the where the engine is and, in some sense, where the rupture or this car, if you want to make this analogy, is going. And uh, this is an example. It's a pretty old numerical model, um, but it's very interesting because it shows here the fault surface and the uh, area is about 250 square kilometers, about 300 square kilometers here. And uh, this, is, uh, this reproduces the false leap during the rupture that of the 1994 Northridge, Northridge earthquake near Los Angeles, 6.9 earthquake. And the earthquake nucleated along fault deep at about 19 kilometers depth, and it propagated from the bottom towards the surface, which was up here. And the colors do represent the slip in the, in the fault patch. So now you will see the rupture propagating very fast from the bottom to the top of the fault surface. It goes very fast. And I try to stop it up here. And as you can see, there is a rupture front on the top part, while in the bottom part is where the rupture heals. So clearly, not the entire fault is rupturing at the same time. The rupture is traveling along the fault surface at the kilometers per second. It was down here at the beginning, and after five seconds, it's up here, which is about 15 kilometers. So the rupture is propagating at about three kilometers per second on average in the continental crust, while the different colors represent the slip on this fault patch. So this yellow color means that the slip here was up to about three meters. So there are two important numbers to remember when we talk about earthquakes. One is the rupture speed, which is of the orders of kilometer per second. And the other one is the velocity of slip. That means that when the two wall rocks are free to slip one against the other, they slip at a relative speed of only one meter per second. So Bolt at the Olympic Games goes 10 times faster when he runs you know, 100 meters in only 10 seconds. So let's now start to put together you know, this uh, small information we, we summarized till now, which is based on seismology. What I show you up to now is information that we get from the inversion of seismic waves. So if you think what happens beneath our feet during an earthquake, well, there is a rupture propagating you know, at kilometer per second between one and five, and at this at this stage, the two blocks start to slip one against the other, and the velocity of slip is on average one meter per second, but there are also abrupt accelerations at deceleration. So one meter per second is an average slip rate, perhaps is of the order of 10 meter per second, the peak speed, or even larger. But after this, the rupture is healing, and several processes can occur on the fault surface. This is just an example when perhaps there is frictional melting on the fault surface, actually in the slipping zone of the earthquake of the fault that is happening. This is just an example. So the, in this case, the rupture is going from the left to the right. And let's try to zoom here at the rupture tip and have a look from above. So this is just a detail. The scale can be from uh, right to left, can be a couple of meters, and the rupture is propagating very fast, a kilometer per second. This is the rupture propagation. And because of this, of, and the huge stress that is localized at the rupture tip of the fracture, basically the rock is pulverized. And at the same time, the fault starts to slip at about one meter per second. So there are two processes happening, that is rock comminution or pulverization of the rock, reduction in very small grains, and with increasing slip, also frictional melting in some cases. And what is astonishing is that we see this in the field. Here is the coin for scale and a fault which is decorated or filled by a glass that was produced during an earthquake about 30 million years ago. So these are earthquake scars. And so events that last few seconds 
in nature, they are remain frozen for a million or years in the rock. Uh, so the idea is to start from fault rocks to study earthquakes. And uh, so this is a complementary approach. And uh, the idea is to start from the field where we can see scars of earthquakes, for instance, of different kind, frictional, solidified frictional melts as pseudotachylites here is just one example. So to study the geometry of faults that have scars of ancient earthquakes with different methods, field survive, so based on uh, terrestrial LIDAR or photogrammetric techniques or differential GPS to describe the complexity of natural faults on one side, because geometry is really important, is controlling basically the nucleation of an earthquake and the propagation of the seismic rupture and its arrest. But on the other side, we can also conduct microstructural studies to understand more about these fault rocks, also using scanning electron microscope to go down to the nanoscale today and to understand more the processes that happen during earthquakes, during seismic sleep. And importantly, we can collect samples and run experiments with the experimental machines. This is an example of these machines. This is called the Shiva where you can slide the two, two small cylinders and uh, measure also the mechanical response. So how these rocks behave when they are sheared under conditions that are similar to those that are uh, occurring in nature. So you can get some theoretical or constitutive row that lows that describe the evolution of shear stress or friction during seismic sleep on a fault. At the same time, you can recover the sample after the experiment and compare the structures you produce in the experiments with, the, with those that you find in nature. And this is really important. We are not material scientists. We are still remain geologists. And our goal here is to understand the process that can happen, can occur in nature, not only those that can occur in the lab. Then we can put all these things together. So field studies and basically mechanical data and constitutive law for friction and uh, put them together by means of numerical models. And this is what I basically will talk at the very end of this seminar. So um, I will follow this path. I will talk about the, how the fault look like in nature and then what kind of experiments you can perform. And then we'll put the two things together by producing even synthetic seismograms by means of numerical models. And these synthetic seismograms at the very end can also be compared with the natural ones. So it's a physically and geologically based model of earthquakes. Well, there is nothing new in all this. Uh, we are following the hint of this ancient, let's call PhD advisor, was Petrus Severinus, a Danish guy, uh, that was, uh, you know, was living about 500 years ago. And uh, what he said was basically go in the field, buy stout shoes, clean the mountains, and look for the various kinds of minerals and note their characters and mark their origin. So this is the first step. But the second one is build furnaces and experiment without cheesing, because in this way you, can, you will arrive at knowledge of the nature and probability of things. So there is nothing new in this approach. However, if you were born in Italy at the same time, like Giordano Bruno, and you try to say similar things, well, you get burned. So he was born in Campo de Fiore at that time. Well, but to follow the hint of this ancient advisor, we need, unfortunately, we need money. Someone said no money, no science. I don't think it's so true, but sometimes you need it. And in this case, this research, this research was funded by the European Research Council for a total of about 4 million years, for 10 years. And so we, you need money to build machine, to go in the field, but also to pay salaries of researchers with different background. And in fact, the story I will tell you today is the story of a collaboration of, between many, many people with different background, engineer, physicist, geologist, geophysicist, seismologist. And these are some of them. 
and uh, Tom Mitchell's to the left, and um, he worked in ING V Rome for a couple of years. Now he's a reader at the university at UCL in London. And uh, when he was when he wake up, basically. But then with other people like Michele did his PhD and is a postdoc now in Manchester. Silvia, well, she's a postdoc in Milano Bicocca. Andrea Bistacchi is a, an associate professor at the University of Structural Geologist at the University of Milan. Fabio Ferri uh, was a professor in, uh, still alive, poor guy, but he's a professor in, uh, uh, in, um, in Colombia. Ashley Griffith uh, now is a professor in Ohio, assistant professor. And Marika Rempe is a postdoc in Liverpool. These people especially work in the field and some of them did experiments. While this is the group that was working and is still working in GV in Rome, which includes uh, many people that now found a permanent position, like postdoc Steven Smith, is a structural geologist at the University of Otago, New Zealand. Andre Niemeyer, he got a permanent position in Utrecht, in Netherlands. Um, then who else? Well, Stefan Nielsen is a food professor now at the University of Durham. Shane Murphy is a postdoc and now uh, a researcher in Brest, in French, permanent position. Marie Violet in Lausanne. Associate professor, while Francois Passeleg with his lost eyes is now a postdoc in uh, Lausanne too. But but then there are older people, and uh, older Fabio, an engineer, Giuseppe, another engineer, and the head here of Gianni Romeo, which is a physicist, that help us to improve the machine at the INGV labs in Rome, where Scarlato was the, the leader. And Elena Spagnolo is still running the machine today with other people not shown here and Sofia Mariano help in managing all these projects. So, and it's a, like ever science is collaboration. And uh, I don't know if this is science, but at least it's what we try to do. Now, I will move forward and try to discuss about the earthquake engine and this example from the Italian Alps. So I will focus on this side of the, out of this talk. And, uh, the idea is to lift the bonnet of the earthquake engine and look inside. So what is the shape of this engine? And as I said, earthquakes are big things. And uh, for a magnitude 5, 6, the fault length for a magnitude 6 is at least 15, 20 kilometers. So you need big, big outcrops and uh, to study earthquake, earthquakes. And... Uh, this is an example in the Southern Alps, and here there is a PhD advisor for scale, which was my PhD advisor, and thank you so much, Giorgio, <laughs> a structural geologist that let, try, tried to teach me a lot, actually. And, uh, well, this outcrop this is located in the Italian Southern Alps, up here, and uh, the, the engine uh, is exposed at about 2,500, 3,000 meter high, above sea level. This is the only geological map I will show you today. And we are, you see, here at the, near the border with Switzerland. And this black line here is called the Tonale Fault, TO, stands for Tonale, which is the most important fault of the Alps. It's a dextral strike slip fault. And a smaller fault of the Tonale Fault system is the Gole Large Fault, GLF in red here, which cuts this uh, gray body, which is the, the Adamello batholith, or let's say on average is only made, let's say to make a very simple story, is made of tonalites, which is the most common rock uh, of the continental crust. The average composition of the continental crust is basically a tonalite. And the fault is dextral, However, it's not active anymore. In fact, this fault is about 30 million years old. And uh, when the earthquake engine or the fault was active, well, these outcrops were located at that time at 9 to 10 to 11 kilometer depth. And the engine, the earthquake engine, is 25 kilometer long. So it's an old rusty engine. It produced an earthquake 30 million years ago and it took millions of years to arrive at the surface from that depth of 10 kilometers. This engine, which is good for us as structural geologists, is exposed at the base of a glacier. And this is how the 
valley look in 1865. You can see the tongue of the glaciers down here. And this was during my PhD in 2003. Now, as you can appreciate, the two glaciers are at the very top. And actually today, you cannot even see the glacier from here. It's farther retreat. And uh, so we are in a lucky situation as a stratologist. Of course, we need to thank perhaps global warming for this. I don't know if it's true or not. Surely there is something wrong going in the Alps. And the glaciers are retreating very, very fast. And the lucky thing for us is that there is a fault just at the base of the glacier. And because of this, the outcrops are really polished. And you can appreciate this from this picture. The glacier is to the right. And you can see the smooth, out, the smooth surface of the outcrops. And there are also some creeks cutting the outcrops, while they, which are these that go from right to left, while these tiny lines here are the faults and fractures that built up the fault zone, which is about half kilometer in width in this area. And it includes at least 200 main subparallel faults. So fault zones are very complicated things. And we can zoom and appreciate the outcrops. You are very polished. And you can see these tiny lines are the individual faults that built up the fault zone. And this is a block for scale here, about one meter. Because of the presence of creeks, you can also see the faults in three dimensions. And we can zoom in individual faults, like here. And uh, what we find are the scars of this earthquake that are about 30 million years old. So this is a seismic glass that geologists call the pseudotachylites. And uh, these are solidified melts. The temperature of this melt was probably between 1400 and 1500 Celsius when it was produced during the propagation of the seismic, seismic rupture. And you can see next to the, the pseudotachylite, the, the tonalite, which is made by biopite and and the whitish mineral are feldspar, and there is some glassy, more glassy light, which is quartz. You can see about some of it here. So we can look now with an optical microscope. So this is an image taken with an uh, optical microscope, and the bar, scale bar down here is half of a millimeter. And uh, this is how these pseudotachylites or seismic glasses, they look like under transmitted light, optical transmitted light. And you can see the flow structures, the brownish color of this glass. And uh, suspended in the glass, you can see the remnants of uh, uh, the, the original rock that melted. So these are mainly class of feldspar and quartz. And sometimes you find these nice st structures that geologists call the spherulites that are due to the growth during solidification of the melt of uh, microlites, of, uh, um, so of tiny crystals, in this case, of feldspar. So this is evidence of cooling from a melt. And uh, you can also use a scanning electron microscope and look more in detail. Now the scale bar is only 15 microns, and you can see clusters that survived from melting this is a backscatter image, so the dark color is quartz in this case, while this gray color is a plagioclase, it's a calcium feldspar. Um, and uh, you can find also tiny crystals that survive from melting, but also this widespread bright matrix, which is mainly made by biotite in, it's mainly biotite in composition, and there are also some small needles of feldspar. This makes the matrix of this glass that they vitified now. It's not a glass anymore, but after 30 million years, uh, become mainly a, a, ultra, a cryptocrystalline uh, rock. So these large outcrops allow us to look at the rusty earthquake engine. And uh, we can use uh, laser scan data and to quantify the structure. And so this is, for instance, an individual fault trace, and we can zoom in a particular of the outcrop. So this is the 3D model of the outcrop, and you can sample 
different points of the fault using a differential GPS in order to produce uh, to reproduce the geometry, for instance, in uh, georeference uh, the geometry of the fault surface. You can use several techniques. This is just an example. Uh, you can reproduce on this particular outcrop how, for instance, the fault trace diverge from an average fault plane. So this is an average fault plane, uh, however the fault surface is rough, so you can follow the trace of the same fault at different points, and you can put this information together by studying the waveness. Um, the idea is to reconstruct the individual fault surface where seismic slip occurred. And you can use the Fourier transform analysis and produce a synthetic fault surface. Now from here to here is 40 meters and, uh, and also from left to right. So the area here is only 1600 square meters. And along this fault surface, you can recognize depressions and culminations. The maximum depression here with respect to the average fault surface was only uh, 15 centimeters and the maximum culmination was about 15 centimeters. So it was a pretty flat surface. However, this roughness is very important because it's controlling the, the propagation of the rupture, is controlling especially the deceleration and acceleration of the seismic rupture, which controls at the very end the emission of seismic waves. What can also it can do is to measure, because there are structural markers, like these dikes that are cut by the fault, you can measure the slip. Now, in some cases, if you do, and it takes a lot of time, if you collect samples and study the texture you find under the optical microscope, especially with scanning electron microscope, well, you can put some information together and you will see that some faults, they only have a continuous layer of glass. It looks like there were no other cataclastic precursors. So maybe in some cases, these faults, few of these faults, are recording perhaps only one seismic slip event. And uh, in some cases where uh, we found these faults, the maximum slip was about 1.5. So this would be consistent with earthquakes of up to magnitude 7. But the other interesting thing when you study these outcrops is that you can find a complex network of fractures and faults that are filled by the glass. For instance, there can be a continuous fault like this one for about three, four meters, and you will see a lot of cracks filled by the glass. And what is interesting it is, is the asymmetry. Uh, the melt was produced along the fault and then injected in the wall rocks. Well, you can explain this asymmetry in several ways, but the most interesting, um, uh, the most easy, actually, answer is, is that this asymmetry is related to the propagation of the rupture. And especially if the faults are dextral, as in this case, and if you run numerical models where the fault uh, is this tiny line, so the fault is going inside the screen, well, if this rupture propagating along a fault like this at kilometers per second, the the propagation of the rupture will trigger a compression and a tension at the rupture tip. And the tensional stresses can be huge, and so the compressional ones can be of the order easily of gigapascal. And so even at the depth of you know, 10 kilometers, these stress are so large that result in formation of cracks. And they were more common, will be much more common where the rock, where the rock is under tension for the, simple, for the simple reason that rocks are 10 times weaker in tension than in compression. So you can explain this asymmetry just by the properties of, uh, of cracks propagation, rupture propagation in a dextral fault. And, uh, and actually the orientation of the cracks is related to the rupture speed. Now, well, this is uh, an example of what people call rupture directivity, which is very important in seismic hazard studies. So this is uh, the kind of information you can get from an outcrop is really amazing. You can get information about, you know, the geometry of the fault, but also about earthquake physics, including rupture directivity. But you can also do something more, which is something that seismology cannot really say much about, which is the absolute value of the friction coefficient. 
the friction coefficient is the ratio between shear stress and normal stress. The big issue is uh, to estimate not only the normal stress acting on the fault, but especially the shear stress. And seismology can tell you something about the stress drop, so the friction drop during seismic sleep, but is very, very complicated to say something about the absolute value of friction. And this is very important because it's the absolute value of friction that controls the earthquake energy budget and so the earthquake physics in general. How you can do this? Well, uh, the idea is to apply the first principle of thermodynamics. And once you show that the fault that is decorated by this pseudo-calculate perhaps or this seismic glass ruptured only once, the idea is that because uh, there is some mechanical work that is done, in this case by friction, along the fault, well, this work is converted into heat. And so you are applying the first principle of thermodynamics. What is this heat? Well, you can quantify the heat based on the amount of seismic glass that you can measure in the field. About the average, basically, is the average thickness of these faults. So in this equation here, to the left, we have shear stress per displacement, which is a work per area, per unit area, and to the right, the heat to melt the rock, which is, a, 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 of course, heat, and basically we're applying the first principle of thermodynamics. And uh, you can put numbers, because you can measure the displacement in the field. For instance, in this particular fold, the, the, because there was a dike as a marker, you have to do some, also some trigonometry. I will skip all this, of course. Well, the displacement was about 1.4 meters. And the average thickness, which includes also the melt that was produced along the fault and injected in the war rocks, was only 6 millimeters, 5.9. So you can, you can estimate the shear stress if you know these values. And uh, by, if you know the thickness, the displacement, the density of the rock, and this term E. This term E is a simple the energy you need to put to heat and melt one kilogram of rock, and for tonalite is 1.7 megajoule per kilogram. So you get numbers out of these, and a number is 18 megapascal. It's a big number, it's a small number. Well, it, it's up to the normal stress, because friction is the ratio of the two. So we can try to plot now the shear stress. We can estimate from the field by using these outcrops and the normal stress, which instead is estimated by the depth of seismic faulting, the orientation of the fault, and other kind of considerations, which are mainly related to the presence of pore pressure of fluids. So you can play, for instance, with a normal stress that spans from about 100 megapascal to almost 200 megapascal. So this is the big, this big error bar um, with an, an average value of about 140 megapascal. This is the normal stress, effective normal stress, that acts on the fault at 10 kilometer depth for this crystalline um, basement. Now, the estimate for shear stress ranges from 13 to 42 megapascal. So the ratio of the two, for, uh, let's say 40 divided by 150, is about 0 0.3. Well, this is much less than the typical value of these rocks, which usually, in, uh, when people do experiments at much lower slip rates and less extreme conditions of deformation, is only 0 0.7. It's much bigger, so it's mm, about twice as big. So this is what the what we get from the field. But uh, now we look at an earthquake engine that is 30 million years old, and uh, perhaps it's quite powerful because we can maybe there were earthquakes of up to minus seven. But let's try to understand how it works. So what are the performances of this earthquake engine? So now we move to the lab. Let's build furnace and experiment without chasing, as uh, this Danish guy was suggesting us. So we move to the right side. And uh, the issue now is, you know, to make this old engine work. And uh, to do this is not easy because, as we said, the performances of the earthquake engine are quite impressive. You know, there are slip rates up to 10 meters per second at the, on the slip surface. 
sleep can be as large as 80 meters, at least what we know from this Japanese earthquake, 9.0. And so big sleep and the stresses are large because earthquakes nucleate a death in the crust and so can easily be larger than 20 megapascal. These conditions are pretty extreme and in some terms a new frontier in material science. And I want to add there is no machine that can simultaneously impose all these conditions to a piece of rock. And uh, perhaps Shiva can make it. Well, Shiva is the slow to high velocity apparatus uh, that was designed by an Italian team and installed at, at the, Institute, the National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology in Rome. This is funded by the European Research Council, this machine. This machine is like a big lathe, basically. And uh, it's about 3.5 meters long, it weights for tons, and uh, it's lead to two cylinders of rocks that are installed here. The sample size is about 50 millimeters in diameter. And uh, to reproduce the load that, uh, or the stress under which um, the rocks are, uh, are found are, um, you know, um, at about you know, some depth in the crust, well, there is this piston. This piston exerts a thrust up to five tons on the rocks. And uh, then from the other side, we try to slid the rocks one against the other. So from this side, we have the rotary motion, while from the left side, while from the right side, the two rocks were pushed one against the other. And there are two engines, so we can cover this slip rate range from 10 microns per second, so a sub-seismic slip rate to study, for instance, aircraft nucleation, up to 6.5 meters per second, which more is a very high seismic slip rate on the samples that are about 50 millimeters in external diameter. Because of this uh, rotary configuration, uh, the displacement can be as large as you wish, however the rock will fail at some point. While you can also apply these large stresses, large zip rates, and also abrupt accelerations, uh, up to 10, actually to 7 Gs, so 70 meter uh, second square, because we apply um, about, uh, we have a lot of a power available, about 300 kilowatts. This is the power dissipated by something like 100 apartments in Italy, so or about 300 wash machines. So all this power is dissipated on this little poor piece of rock. So clearly it will suffer a lot. And uh, Shiva, uh, this is how basically looks like today. Uh, there is a fluid pressurization system because you, you want to perform sometimes experiments in the presence of fluids. And also, if you want to study friction, which is a very complicated thing to study, I must say, some, because it's highly environmental dependent. Well, maybe you want to do some experiments in the presence of some gases, argon, nitrogen, no oxygen in the system, or even under vacuum. So this is the vacuum pump. And uh, we also do uh, several experiments, uh, especially, of course, when we can see the sample from outside. So as uh, the one I will show you now, using a high-speed camera. And this is an example. This was one of the very first experiments. And here we, are, we will have a piece of uh, a cylinder of gabbro. This is the and uh, about what we call the shortening, about how the axial column was moving toward the rotary side. And you can see that after the experiment, of course, the melt solidifies in a glass which cools down. And here you see uh, the, gl the glass uh, fibers here. So in this experiment, the velocity was 5 meters per second, the normal stress 25 megapascal. I can show you the movie again, just to give you a feeling uh, of what's going on. And, uh, well, there is nothing new, new in this. The, rapid, the very rapid friction of two bodies produces fire. So this is Leonardo da Vinci. We cannot, you know, 
spend of 300,000 euros of the taxpayer taxpayer to say this. I mean, uh, however, perhaps you can make better movies today. And actually, Leonardo was a bad guy, of course, probably was a good PhD advisor. Um, but uh, more important is that you can collect the sample and uh, you can, you know, see, a, look, have a look at these glasses once they're solidified. And uh, these again are the quartz class and the first part class, in, now in a matrix which is really made of all this, this gray material here, which is glass. You can, you can use a high speed camera to investigate the full process in detail. So this will move slowly now. There is one frame every millisecond. The camera is infrared. That means that when you see bright, it's more than 500 Celsius. And you can see now the debris projected away. And uh, this is a colder one moving away. Importantly, you can put the two things together. Here to the left, you have the sample with a high-speed camera movie, and to the right, the mechanical data, so the shear stress, or in some sense, the friction coefficient. And so I will allow the movie to go. So you will see now some powders falling down, and at some point you will see some bright spots. At this stage, the shear stress is pretty constant. But when you will have a continuous layer of this bright material, which is melt, the fault is lubricated, and so the friction goes down. All this happens in few milliseconds, in some hundreds of milliseconds. And uh, there are, there, this is the elastic deformation of the machine. There is something interesting going here. I will not talk about this. But what I will focus more is about this stage of lubrication of the experimental fault in the next slides. Um, so I can show now an example, you know, of the experimental data we get. So this is shear stress in blue, and uh, while uh, in gray is the slip rate, these are older experiments. And uh, you can see how the shear stress evolves and then drops down. There were some spurious vibration in these experiments. But what is interesting is that we can measure what is the strength of a rock when it is lit during an earthquake. So we are studying now the performances of the earthquake engine in terms of friction, in terms of fracture energy, and other things that maybe we can address another time. Uh, so these are the experiments, but we can go forward and we can also try to model what's going on during frictional melting in rocks and in, in other materials in general. Now, uh, there are several processes going on that is not so easy to put together. And it took two years of work for a colleague of mine, Stefan Nielsen, to come out with a theoretical law for frictional melt lubrication. It's a general law, but the input parameters are those. So that we have melting of the rock, and then, so there is, what is important is the rock, rock melting rate. As you can also appreciate in the experiments, the, the piston was moving towards the sleeping zone. So this is what happens also in nature. The rock is melted and there is some latent heat of fusion that is exchanged here at the boundary between the rock, the solid rock and the melt. And uh, what is very important in melt lubrication is the thickness of the melt. It's not only important the viscosity of the melt, but the melt thickness. That's another very important property for lubrication in general. And uh, because of the viscosity, also we have shear eating, we have further eating of the melt, and then the extrusion in the wall rocks. So this is, all this happens during frictional melting in nature and also in the experiments. Most of the melt also in nature is found injected in the wall rocks. If you try to calculate the amount of melt or glass to that now in the exhumed faults. Well, this is the answer. Uh, it's a constitutive law that puts together on the left side the shear stress that you can measure based on the normal stress applied um, in, uh, in the experiments and also in nature. So you can see that uh, it's a power law and the power is 0.25. So it's a nonlinear relationship. 
And there are other parameters here. I will not I will not talk about them. One is very important, of course, is the velocity. W includes the viscosity of the melt. And what is very interesting is also this term R, which is the melt escaping distance. What this term is saying is that, for instance, if the injection veins are far away from, from one from the other, this R will be big, and at that point, tau will be small. That uh, is the same principle that you can you can think of when um, it's raining and there is uh, uh, looking at Formula One cars, you know, on. And what happens is that if it's raining, they change the tires and the new tires, they have usually deep grooves. And the reason is because you want the water to to have a better adherence of the tires on the asphalt. You want the water to get out as fast as possible from the tire. And so it's the same thing. Bigger is R, you know, um, or and more lubricated will be the fault. And the same happens in uh, in this uh, in Formula One. Now, this is a general law for uh, melt lubrication and should be valid also for other rocks, including ice. And uh, so you can test the, this uh, theoretically based friction law. And uh, so this is normal stress, this is shear stress. And these are several experiments uh, where uh, we measure the friction of what we call the steady state. So here, and you can find this relationship where the, if you do more, more different experiments with increasing normal stress, you find this relationship that goes uh, with the relationship between shear stress and normal stress goes with the power of one quarter. Uh, instead, what you expect from friction, typical friction laws is a linear relationship. So clearly because of lubrication in this case operated by friction melts of the fault surface, we diverge from the typical behavior of rocks. This is the case for frictional metal lubrication, but actually it's a general behavior of faults when they're sheared at about one meter per second, so during earthquakes. So uh, we can try to put all this information together. There's, this is shear stress, this is normal stress, and this is the field evidence which suggests that faults are lubricated based on this kind uh, of measurements you can do in the field thickness and you know the of the pseudotachylite, the displacement accommodated by the fault from the structural markers and so on. But then from the experiments you already observe you already observe that you can uh, when the presence of in this case of fictional melting, of course you are diverging from the typical behavior of rocks. And uh, you can extend this now. These are more recent experiments we did, and even with serpentinized, where we had also melting. And you can see with the Shiva, we went up to another megapascal. So we are almost approximating what we measure in the field in other rocks, in tonalites, other crystalline rocks. So the experimental data are really suggesting lubrication of faults. And at the at very end, if you also use the theoretical equation, which, has, which are based, as I told you before, on a theoretical analysis of frictional metal lubrication, well, you get the same. So faults look like are lubricated by friction melts when they are produced in nature. So can we extrapolate now this experimental observation to nature? Okay, this is an old guy now. Yes, we can. Uh, like Obama said some about 12, I think 10 years ago. Well, as you can see here, uh, this is the natural uh, fault rock. The scale is the same in these pictures to uh, natural reverse experiment. Here we have the natural fault. So these are five millimeter and here is the experimental fault where you can find some bits of glass. But if you look especially at the, the scan electron microscope where the scale bar is 50 microns now, to the left is the natural one and to the experimental and to the right is the experimental one. You can see the fabric is pretty similar. There is the main difference is the, the, the vitrification process that happened in, in nature. So we have a, a bright matrix now and uh, which is of course slightly different from what you see in the experiments. So the, what I want to highlight here is that like this uh, beautiful lady, which is Carolina Costner, skates, you know, 
slides on the ice, thanks to a, a thin film of water that is produced by frictional melting, basically, uh, at the, between the blade, the steel blade and the ice. Well, she can slid because of film of water. The same happens during earthquakes, where the two rocks can slid one against the other because of the presence of a frictional, uh, of frictional melts of rock. Uh, now you can also do experiments with other materials. You can, other than crystalline rocks like the one I showed you before, you can use gouges, so powder of rock, like dolomite, rich gouges, calcite rich gouges, or clay rich, or whatever. Or you can do experiments in the presence of fluids, so you have particular vessels where you put your sample inside in the pressurized system, like here. And you can do hundreds of these experiments, actually thousands, and the answer is always the same. There are some differences, but what we see is that the friction coefficient decreases with increasing sleep when rocks are shear at seismic sleep rates of about one meter per second. It's a sort of general law. There are different peak values. If you play with a clay, the peak friction must, must be lower, can be 0 0.4, can be 0 0.2. However, again, the friction evolves with sleep and decays. If you use solid rock, like the one I told you before, uh, you can have, you know, in the case of uh, gabbros, you can have melting. In the case of uh, marbles, which are made of calcite or dolomite, the, 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 low, the, the decay is about the same, although there are some details that I won't discuss here. But the message is that faults are duplicated during earthquakes, independently of rock type and weakening mechanism. So we can came out with a very simple uh, best fit. It's a sleep weakening law, so friction decreases with the sleep according to an exponential law, uh, where D is the displacement. And DTH is a particular uh, parameter that describes the evolution or the shape of the exponential curve. Now, uh, this kind of process may explain the extraordinary sleep of some earthquakes. In the case of Tuoco, out uh, uh, about 50 meters of sleep. And in fact, if there was no fault duplication, for when you have 50 meters of sleep, probably you can produce a volcano here just because of the huge amount of heat produced. So fault must be lubricated. Now, let's go to put all this information together, making the earthquake engine work in monomerical models. So this is the synthesis of all this work. So uh, the problem is that our experiments are investigating the friction at a point of a fault, which is very small. The diameter is only, you know, 50 millimeters. And we get these friction loads that are valid in a small bit of, on a small patch of the fault, very, very, very small. And the fault patch we measure in the field is still small, but you can think, you can see how big it is compared to our sample, which is even smaller than what I'm showing here. So we are not really introducing, you know, the geometry, the complexity of natural faults uh, when we study friction in the lab. We cannot do this. And uh, well, I will try to to do this uh, in the case for the Tuhoku earthquake. Um, so we will study uh, thanks by thanks to numerical models and by applying, you know, this physical. Uh, physically based or, you know, it will be a physically based uh, model which exploits the empir empirical friction loss we get from the lab, but also the geology we can imagine in the subduction zones. So the idea is to put together full geometry with a full friction law we get from the lab and in this particular context. And this is a collaboration we did with people from the National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology that work in tsunami sources. So the next slide will be a cross section. And uh, now the scale is very big. Of course, these are 50 kilometers, the scale bar. So this is the lower plate of the Pacific Ocean that goes beneath Japan, so the Eurasian plate. And so this is the upper plate moving relative to the lower plate at about 8 centimeters per year. And the hypocenter location of the Tuhoku earthquake was at about 40 kilometer depth. The different colors represent different mechanical properties we gave to the upper crust, middle crust, and then the uh, mantle wedge. And uh, 
So this is, uh, we use a two-dimensional spectral element methodology. And uh, so this is the fault here. And these are the nodes of the, of the model. And uh, we attribute different properties. I don't want to go much in detail, just to tell you that at the, uh, this goes now along depth. Um, in the very first 12, 15 kilometers, we attributed these properties to the fault materials. So wet clays, that means that the, the static friction is 0 0.25, while during sliding, the friction can go down to 0 0.1. So this is based on our experimental evidence. And because these are clays, they must have a low yield strength. So the fault, of course, is weaker the surface. But then at depth, we have cohesive rocks, can be gabbro, serpentinized, and so on. And so the peak friction here is higher, perhaps in 0.7, while the steady state, whatever it is, uh, its meaning is probably much lower, it's about 0.2, based again on experimental evidence. And of course, the yield strength must be higher. And so the red curve here represents the yield strength of this fault. And clearly there is also this strange behavior here because it includes also what we know about the pore pressures at the mantle wedge and, and the accretionary wedge and so on, the pore pressure distribution. While going at depth is much more difficult to know what exactly happens in terms of yield strength. We don't know the pore pressures down there. At the same time, this is initial stress distribution and this is an example. Uh, we run hundreds of, of models playing with different initial shear stress. And here is the, for this case, we uh, uh, allow the rupture to nucleate at about 45 km depth. This is one of the many simulations of earthquakes that can occur in uh, uh, Tuhoku-like environments and subduction environments. Once the rupture propagates, the shear stress can evolve following this friction law. And these are some examples. The black line comes from this depth, on, or the blue one instead comes from down here. So once the, 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 once the fault comes lead, it will follow some kind of uh, law that we determine from the experiments. So this is the result. This is one of these many simulations, uh, one example. And uh, here the red dots are sort of a virtual, virtual accelerometers at the surface. Here will be under the sea floor, while here will be almost at the surface. And this is the plate interface and the, the earthquake nucleated at 25 km depth. So you will see here the propagation of waves while the rupture is propagating along the fault surface up to the, surf up to the surface, to the bottom uh, of the ocean floor. So the rupture is propagating a couple of kilometers per second, and you can see the arrival of the wave at the surface, while the red curve represents the velocity in the individual patches. This is a pretty complicated, sophisticated model. However, it's only two-dimensional, and, uh, and it doesn't include the damage due to the rupture of propagation. So there are some limitations. But in any case, it catches the main observation of the earthquakes. Uh, at the same time, we could see, uh, which I find pretty interesting, i show you again, you know, the, all the effects due to the bouncing of the waves from the surface down to the, to the bottom. So it includes, it's a, a con total complete elastodynamic model, even though can be still improved. So this is just been published this year. Um, so you can do many of these experiments by keeping constant yield strength, but by moving the initial shear stress distribution, which is something very difficult to know. Actually, we don't know exactly what it is. We have some idea of what's going on at the surface just because of equilibrium conditions of accretionary wedges. And to the bottom is the slip you can get for this different initial shear stress distribution and initial earthquake nucleation locations. And uh, these are three extreme cases uh, where, based on the initial shear stress distribution, you can obtain in these models thrust earthquakes. So the slip is just at depth, it doesn't arrive at the surface, the rupture does not arrive at the surface, this is slip 
versus that. However, in particular cases, you can have mega trust earthquakes, like the one I, I've been discussing you um, before, I was showing you before. And here the slip can be of 30 meters on the surface, or, so this would be magnitude 9 earthquakes, but also you can get tsunami earthquakes that are, are a particular kind of earthquake that propagate especially at the very, in the very shallow sections. So it's just based on the shear stress initial conditions and uh, by using empirical law, friction law we get from the lab experiments and also introducing the complexity of fold geometry in this uh, shear stress initial distribution. We play here, rather than really fold geometry, we play with the shear stress distribution, which is uh, sort of self-defined. But I don't go, not, cannot go in details on this. So, uh, however, this approach, which has been applied in airquake mechanics, allows us to investigate also other friction and weird process of geological materials like uh, landslides, for instance, we apply this in this kind of studies, but also in the extrusion uh, of lava domes. Uh, because again, you can appreciate here that there are sliding surface. Uh, and you can move towards also induced seismicity. So uh, to apply this kind of approach for you know wastewater disposal and fracking, CO2 sequestration, and uh, gas storage, you know for energy. So in the in the industry in general, geothermal fields, but also to study wear of material. So it's a, something you can apply. It's not only fundamental science. There are plenty of applications of these kind of studies. So I will conclude here. Uh, you must be very tired. So, fog, fog earthquakes, they treat large areas of the world. <clears throat> we know very little about earthquake physics. And uh, the idea, of course, is to use a multidisciplinary approach, which is complementary to the seismological approach. And this approach will exploit geological, experimental, and theoretical studies. And this can give a, you know, a new view, in some sense, of the earthquake engine. I must say this, uh, this kind of multidisciplinary approach is performed by several people around the world, although because of uh, you need a big grant, you know, in order to do this, all this in the same project, I must say. Uh, at the very end, this approach has been already applied to investigate other geological processes, so not only earthquakes, and perhaps, and I think you will find good application in the industry. And so thank you very much for your for your attention.